What's up dudes and dudettes, barbs and barbells? Today we got a Q&A on the way. We're going to jump right into things with question number 21. Usually I do 20, but two questions are very similar, so I sort of uh, mush them together. So, during a bulk, do the extra calories literally go into materially building muscle, or do they just sort of signal an abundance of resources available in the body? Uh, the answer is yes, it does both of those things. I don't know if it's possible to like doubly label the calories and try to find out exactly where they go. Uh, I think they've done that with protein and it's hard to say exactly what is happening and what ratios, but yes, both are happening. And so when you are eating enough food, it kind of signals to the body that you have enough energy. Your body can sense how much energy is available to it, both in the short term when you eat a meal, but also in the longer term. This is why if you diet down and get super, super shredded, like for a bodybuilding show, and then you have one big meal, you're not really satisfied. You could eat far, far more, and it takes a long time for that diet fatigue to go away. So part of it is your body fat percentage, which is just energy availability in the form of fat. If you're super shredded, you're going to be hungrier generally, whereas when you're bulked up, usually you won't be as hungry because your body is trying to regulate that and manage it. So this is why if you're bulked up already, you don't really need to bulk in most cases because you already are signaling to your body that it has enough energy because it literally does have enough energy on its body. Whereas when you're shredded, this is where bulking might have more benefits because you literally already have less energy on your body and you could make use of that new energy better. And the extra calories might go into building muscle, or maybe those extra calories just go to other functions, and the calories that you were going to use for other functions go to building muscle. So it's not like you go from maintenance to 200 more, and those 200 calories that you were eating more, like that extra meal, directly goes into building muscle. No, your body sort of uses energy as it comes in, and then it uses it later, and so it's not like the meal that you add is the only thing that is going to be building muscle. That's not exactly how it works. You also might have to consider vitamins and minerals. When you're eating more, you tend to just have more of those, which might impact things too. Plus hormones. Yes, this can impact things. I'm not a huge fan of the idea of insulin is all that matters for fat loss. Well, no, but there's a reason why professional enhanced bodybuilders often use insulin because it can be quite anti-catabolic and even potentially anabolic. And so yes, eating more food will give you more area under the curve of insulin, which could impact growth as well. All right, next question, number 20, should you run the same program again, assuming goals are the same until you plateau or change, alter the program after every mesocycle? So I think there's a fine line between changing too much and not changing enough. If you are always doing the same exact plan, maybe it's still working, but you're not necessarily learning anything because you're not changing anything. On the other hand, if your goals are the same and assuming the program worked well, well there's no need to change everything. Maybe you make some small tweaks and changes and exercise here and exercise there. Maybe a little bit of a rep range change, maybe add in pause squats rather than normal squats, that kind of thing. Make those those fairly minor modifications so that you can actually tease out those differences because that is what A-B testing is. You're comparing this program to the last program and seeing if these changes had the impact that you were looking for. If you run the same program, you don't get that. If you change everything, the split, the exercises, the rep ranges, everything, you don't know exactly what is causing what. Even just changing a few things, it's already hard to test. And so you have to change just a few things. If you change everything or nothing, it just doesn't work. Question number 19. See a lot of people preaching two extremely hard sets to failure for each exercise. How do I know if I should progress to three sets or not? So I look at two things. First, are you progressing? If you're progressing off of two sets, I would say there's nothing wrong with keeping it at two sets. If you are not progressing, then you can look at maybe adding in the third set if you feel good. If you feel up to it, if you feel hungry, if you feel motivated, if you aren't banged up, etc. If you're not progressing, but you also feel really beaten up, a third set is not going to be the answer here, right? If anything, it might be, could be a deload. 
could be keeping a rep in the tank, potentially. I know that sounds like blasphemy to some people coming from me, but yeah, on some movements, I think keeping a rep in the tank, especially if that last rep seems to look really ugly in some cases, that could be the solution here. So you have to be not progressing and you have to feel good in order to increase your volume, in my opinion. If you're making progress, don't fall into the trap of, oh, maybe I could be making better progress if I added in volume. Maybe that's true. Or maybe that's not true. You don't know. And so I would say wait until you plateau because you will plateau at some point and then see if you also feel good. Then add the volume if you're up for it. Next question, number 18, kind of related, but different enough that I kept it as a separate question. When we plateau on a lift, how to decide whether to stick with it or switch it out. So some people like to do things in blocks. So they run an A week block, then they change everything or they change a few things and they keep it very fixed. Like, Two months, two months, two months, etc. I don't see anything wrong with that. Other people have more of an evolving program. So if something stalls, then they swap just that out, but nothing else. Something else stalls. Oh, this movement is causing a little bit of knee pain. So I swap that out. And so their program kind of evolves more organically and naturally rather than just, oh, Monday, week nine, I start something new. I think both are viable, both are okay. And I've used both at various points with myself and with clients. Now, when you plateau on a lift, you have to make sure you're actually plateaued because a lot of the time people are not plateaued. Just because you did the same weight as the last week, that doesn't mean you're plateaued, right? Maybe you're just at the point, like I am, where you're gaining a rep every month or a rep every two weeks or maybe even slower. And so you need to actually have the faith in the program to realize that you're going to be repeating performance quite a bit, which kind of sucks but that's the reality of being an advanced natural lifter. Progress is going to be slow. On some movements, I would be happy with six reps in a year. I'd be thrilled with that. Six reps in a year. That's a rep every two months. And so, yes, there are going to be a lot of times where technically on, on paper, in the spreadsheet, I'm going to be plateaued. But I can also be observant. I can also see, okay, well, I am actually, it feels a little bit easier. Or that last rep took a second last. It was it was a six second grinder instead of a seven second grinder. Uh, or maybe I had a little bit more control in the eccentric, etc. Or maybe I was in a slightly fatigued state and yet I still maintain performance. Like those are all small things that might not show up in the numbers, but you can tell that things are headed in the right direction. And I think sometimes you can plateau and still be getting in very, very productive work, right? Like don't think just because I'm not adding weight to the bar that I'm not stimulating muscle growth. You quite possibly are, especially if your technique is getting better, especially if you feel like it is working well. And so I would rather people add weight to the bar, but that might not always happen, especially at the rate that a lot of people expect. Now, if it is causing pain or discomfort, I tend to swap things out pretty quick. I, I think in that case, it's just not worth sticking with it in most cases. Sometimes there's a bit of discomfort in the beginning and then later it feels good. You know, if someone's like, ah, oh, front squats, they're not comfortable. Well, it's rare to have someone start front squats and have them be comfortable, right? Um, and so in that case, sometimes just say, okay, let's give it a few more weeks. That's fine. But if you're doing, uh, let's say you're doing skull pressures and from the very moment you do the rep, your elbows are like, you know, no, no. Even with light weights, just some people just doing that and they just, it does not agree with them, swap it out. There's really no harm in swapping out any movement. And so, yeah, kick it to the curb, baby. By the way, this video is sponsored by Boost Camp. So they are an app where you can check and log your progress. You can write all of your exercises in there, sets, reps, super easy to use, very, very intuitive. I myself use it to track my own training and I am really, really enjoying it. Plus, it gives you access to some of the best exercise workout plans on the market. Most of them are free. You can just go to the app. You have free access to the programs. I myself have three programs up there, Ravage, Rampage, and the Recovering Power Lift program. So you can check those out and uh, hope you enjoy them. And once again, thank you to Boost Camp for sponsoring this video. Next question, quite an interesting one, especially given the uh, length and partial discussion is pausing at the bottom of lifts better for hypertrophy than not pausing? Uh, well, first of all, it does depend a little bit on the exact lift. Let's say you're doing a spider curl where 
at the bottom position, there's almost no tension. It's very, very easy. I mean, you could just hold 200 pounds per hand with straps there. It's really, there's no resistance at all, no tension. In that case, pausing probably has no particular benefit. If anything, it's probably making it easier. And generally, when you're making a lift easier, you're probably not going to be growing more muscle. That's a pretty good heuristic. I actually don't know what that word means. I've just heard smarter people than me use it in a similar context to that. So let's let's hope that I got that one right. Now, if the lift is most challenging in the bottom position, it might be better to pause, but it also might not be. Is a paused squat going to be more hypertrophic than a non-paused squat? Well, you're certainly spending more time in that length and position. You're probably making the movement more challenging, but you're probably also reducing the amount of weight that you can use. Also, I don't think that the forces are necessarily going to be higher in that bottom length and position with a paused squat. In fact, they're probably going to be lower because of lower weight and also because you're really controlling the weight down. So there's going to be less rebound, less passive tension. And so on the whole, I think pausing is good, but it's certainly not necessarily. And anyone who's like, no, nah, man, I pause because it's so much better for growth. Uh... I think that's unlikely. It might be mildly better. It might be easier on the body. It might be if you've had like knee issues, maybe pause squats are going to be just more knee friendly than non-pause squats. Uh, but on the whole, I don't see these being massively better. All right, next question. A bunch of mini questions here. How aggressively do you think it's safe to cut relative to one's TDEE, total daily energy expenditure, assuming adequate protein intake, minimum 0.7 grams per pound of body weight, and for how long? Also, assuming reduced volume during a cut, we'll get to that a little bit, is it best to focus hypertrophy or strength, or just mix them both in to maintain muscle mass? So let's start in reverse order, mix it up. Training for hypertrophy is always better for hypertrophy than strength. Okay, you could maybe make the argument that the strength potentiates what you could do for hypertrophy, but I think for most people, don't focus on lower reps, like singles, doubles, triples, rather than 5 to 30. I think that hypertrophy, just by definition, training is better for hypertrophy. So, yeah. You're also assuming that you're going to have to reduce your volume. I think that is not a good assumption. I, I think it shows that your head is not in the right place. You might have to reduce it at the very end of a cut if you're getting very, very lean. But... It should never be a huge reduction. If it's a huge reduction, it means that your fatigue management is bad or your, or if something else is going really bad, maybe your sleep, which could happen. But I mean, at most, I would probably write in like a, maybe a 20% to 30% drop in volume, somewhere around there. And that shouldn't be to the end. I mean, if you're going from, let's say, 20% body fat down to 12% body fat, so like the top of the bulk down to getting fairly lean, it should not impact your volume very much. And so based on the fact that you think that your volume will have to go down, I think that maybe you're cutting too aggressively. I typically look at anywhere from about a pound per week to maybe two pounds per week. Uh, if you are maybe a little bit higher in body fat percentage, you can be more aggressive. Also, if all your situations in life, in terms of training, in terms of stress, in terms of sleep, if those are on point, you can cut more aggressively and probably maintain performance and muscle mass. Whereas if your sleep is bad, you're really stressed out, you're just not in a good situation, it's not like you can just attach a number and a diet length and you spit out how much muscle you're going to lose or not lose or gain or whatever. Um, there's a lot of stuff in terms of, I mean, in terms of hormones. Look at steroid users. I've seen people recomp into a fucking bodybuilding show. They go from like 20% body fat in the off season. And then now they're, uh, you know, three or four months later, they're 5% body fat on stage. The same body weight. They recomped into a show because, you know, the drugs are, are working their magic. So it's not as clear as like calories and diet length because there's a lot of other stuff potentially going on. All right, next question. For a balanced upper body physique, how would you treat back width versus thickness? How much do you think skeletal structure influences this ratio? So you could say that if you have broader shoulders naturally, maybe you should not focus as much on width because you already have that and focus more on thickness. Okay, fair enough. Whereas if you have fairly narrow shoulders, 
then you can focus more on um, on width to kind of balance that out. I think that makes sense. But if you're already wide, why not get even wider? You know, if you're if you're already thick, why not get even thicker? Right? Why not embrace your strengths? So I would say this is mostly personal preference, right? Um, but you can also do both, right? Like, why would training for width impact your thickness? Why would training for thickness impact your your width? So. I would say personal preference, and then you can do both, and they don't impact each other all that much. The back is very, very resilient. You can uh, absolutely abuse it, and it'll it'll just grow pretty well. And so, yeah, I would say, why not do both? All right, next questions, 14 and 13. I kind of lumped them together because they're pretty pretty similar. So question, 14, is it okay to cut the range of motion a bit short on Romanian deadlifts? I have seen, seen some people make the plates skim the floor and people doing Romanians in a deficit. Is it really worth it considering your goal is glute and ham hypertrophy? Or is it better to increase the weight with a slightly lesser range of motion? Let's say the bar comes a couple inches below the knees. The other question was also a range of motion question. I'll, I'll put it on the screen. Very, very similar, but more general. I would say it kind of depends on how much you have to sacrifice to get that extra range of motion. You see some people using perfect form, perfect technique, full range of motion, ultra controlled. The set takes two fucking minutes. It's a marathon. But then you look at the weight on the bar and you're like, oh, like they're probably not doing very fucking much, right? Like they're, oh, they're super controlled. They're doing their squats. Oh my God, it's all the way down. Ah, uh, their ass is touching their heels. It's amazing. They're doing this five second pause and then they stand up. Like it looks, it looks beautiful. Don't get me wrong. It looks beautiful. But is this going to be as effective as squatting a little bit higher? Maybe not quite as controlled, but using like twice as much weight in some cases. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think sometimes people have too much ego attached to range of motion. They might say, no, no, ego lifting, that's when you use too much weight. Why? Some people are attached to the too much weight side of things. Some people are attached to the too much range of motion and too much control side of things. And both can fuck you. It also depends on your mobility and how exactly you're doing the movement. You see some people squat and they get down to a certain range of motion and the knees just don't go any further forward. The tension starts dumping into the lower back and them going deeper is not working more quads, right? Like the knees go forward and then they go deeper and the knees actually come back, right? And yeah, they're going deeper, but are they actually training their quads more? Probably not. And you see this in a lot of movements. Maybe someone's doing a barbell bench press and they get down to just where they can't go any deeper and then... Like they start dumping the bar, they start doing like weird things with their shoulders. And that is kind of like using your rotator cuff to like get off the chest and then hope you get it far enough so your triceps can lock it out. Whereas maybe if they use less range of motion, I know sacrilege, and they actually just focused on the chest and feeling a stretch and then using the chest rather than doing like some kind of weird external rotation bullshit uh, or using like leg drive or sinking the bar, that kind of shit. Less range of motion does not necessarily mean less range of motion for the area you're targeting. It certainly doesn't mean less stress in the area that you're targeting. For an RDL specifically, let's say you get down just below your knees, you have tight lower back, you have fairly stiff-legged position, you're getting this nice big stretch on the hamstrings, and someone says, oh, we gotta go deeper because I saw this on a video. And so you go deeper, but but now your knees are coming forward. You're getting more of a squat pattern. Maybe your, your upper back is rounding, maybe your lower back is rounding, and you're getting more range of motion, but you're taking tension off of the hamstrings, which might be your goal. Now, if your goal is spinal erectors, or if your goal is are glutes, that might make sense because you're getting more range of motion for those areas. Um, so it kind of just depends on your goals, depends on your technique, and uh, it is a complicated topic. Next question, how much of an effect do stress levels have on muscle growth? Would a constantly stressed out person make significantly mess less muscle over make significantly like it's a fucking pie like you're just baking up this muscle all right it's a weird way to phrase it but fair enough 
would they gain less muscle compared to a constantly stress-free person, assuming they're exactly the same and do the same things in and outside the gym in that period of time? Uh, yeah, I would say yes. Uh, I think there was a study on athletes. Maybe I'll dig it up and find it. Maybe not. I've read it like probably six or seven years ago. During exam seasons, they gained less muscle or maybe they lost performance or they progressed slower. And so, yes, mental stress or just stress in general, being anxious, being wound up, not being able to relax and, and recover. Yeah, it, it can have a significant and measurable impact. And this is where it's hard as a coach when someone reports their stress as like a 9 out of 10, you're just like, okay, well, if you're really a 9 out of 10, it's going to be tough to make progress just because you're going to have trouble recovering, you're going to have trouble focusing and performing. It, it impacts things in the gym, but also between the sessions in terms of your recovery. So, yeah, and then it also impacts your sleep. It's just, and then bad sleep impacts your stress and it just becomes this vicious cycle. And so, you know, people need to learn to, to chill the fuck out. And I, I know that's easy to say and harder to do, but all your stress is mental. If it's something at work, if it's a relationship, like your stress is under your control. It, compl it It is. It just absolutely is. I mean, there are a million reasons why I could stress out, why I could worry about things, but just, just try to shut that shit down uh, and realize that it's it's just being counterproductive. Your own evolutionary systems are being used against you by yourself and your boss is not a tiger in the jungle that you have to go into a fight or flight state to deal with okay your boss is not a tiger in the jungle and you can tell him or her that i said that send them this shit okay you are not a tiger motherfucker also give this person a raise and some time off and maybe a nice back rub too all right, next question on pre-exhaust. Does pre-exhaust decrease recruitment of a muscle later on or make it more likely to be the limiting factor of a later movement? So I think this depends on the movement in question. And this is why I think pre-exhaust can be so hit or miss. Let's say you do leg extensions and then you go do squats. You've been sort of good morninging your squat. You're not getting a lot of quads. And so you say, okay, I'm going to do some leg extensions then my squats so that the quads are more of a limiting factor. Well, this could just lead to you doing even more of a good morning because your quads are tired. So a lot of this, you need to have intentionality with how you're moving for it to be of any use, especially on movements that are very, very easily cheatable. What if you do a bunch of flies before dumbbell bench pressing? Well, it's pretty damn hard to avoid the chest when you're, when you're doing a dumbbell bench press. I mean, I guess you could maybe like start doing more tricep, but that's just, it just feels really awkward to try to do a dumbbell bench press with your triceps. And so I guess you could use more pec or more shoulder if you're elevating your shoulders. Um, but I think for the most part, it's hard to get away from the pecs for a dumbbell bench press. But it, again, this goes down to technique, right? It goes down to having a good setup keeping a good chest, a good high chest position, and actually driving through with the pack. So ultimately, it's going to boil down to your technique, no matter what your exercise order is. Next question, will an aggressive mini cut, say losing 15 to 20 pounds in four weeks, be enough to potentiate a new bulk? Well, it'll probably be enough to potentiate a new binge. I would say this depends on how lean you are. If you are already like 15% body fat, I don't see this turning out very well at all. You're probably going to uh, have some kind of lean body mass loss. But if you're a bit thicker, let's say you're 25% body fat, I mean, that's still pretty freaking aggressive. But with the water weight, with the higher body fat percentage, this might be viable. Just make sure that when you bulk, it's a lot more slow than the cut because typically you want to cut faster then you bulk slower. Cut fast, bulk slow. Whereas a lot of people mess this up where they cut slowly, then they bulk quickly and they cut slowly. It just doesn't work out as well. So I would not get too attached to that 15 to 20 pound rate of loss because that is quite aggressive. But I think for the most part, I don't hate the strategy. All right, next question. Who would win in a fight? 100 duck-sized Jeffs 
or one elephant sized Greg Doucette. Uh, does he get to use his supplements? Because that would make a big difference. I'm just kidding. They don't work. <laughs> they don't work. You're, you're wasting your money. Just had to throw that in, you know. Uh, so in all seriousness, because this is a very serious question, I'm going to bet on myself. I'm going to bet on myself. We take this. It's not even going to be close. He's going to be devastated. And uh, I think he's lost quite a bit of momentum recently. So, uh, yeah, easy win. Easy win. All right, next question. Is there a distinction between drop sets and myo reps in terms of stimulus or recovery? Also, not a question, but would love a video on time-saving techniques and related considerations. Uh, alternate supersets, intensity techniques, frequency manipulations, bang for your buck exercises. Yeah, I have a video planned on high intensity sort of advanced techniques, and uh, I think that'll be quite interesting because I have changed my opinion on them quite a bit in the past few years. Now, is there a distinction between drop sets and myo reps? So instead of myo reps, I will just say rest pause as a whole. Myo reps are a specific type of that. In general, I prefer rest pause rather than drop sets. I look at drop sets as more of a metabolic stress type of thing. And I think that you're better off keeping the same weight and either maybe getting a slight amount of momentum, maybe reducing the range of motion slightly, or maybe rest pausing rather than dropping the weight, uh, especially if it's already a light movement. I think the weight is going to be so light that yes, you're continuing the set. Yes, you're still, there's a lot of burn, there's a lot of pump, etc. cetera. Um, yes, you can still gain muscle doing that for sure. But in general, I like to keep the weight the same on most movements for most people most of the time. How much does the quality of macros matter purely from a hypertrophy standpoint? Like, if I were to have Pop-Tarts instead of brown rice, same amount of total calories, and made similar diet choices like that, how terribly could it affect my overall workouts and total muscle growth? Obviously, health-wise, it wouldn't be great. So I think in the short term, it would probably have almost no impact. Um, when people say stuff like, you know, yeah, I switched from chicken to beef and I made, oh, it had such a big impact. Ah, I'm skeptical. Unless you were deficient in some mineral or vitamin and even then, like, not super likely that that's going to happen. Uh, I would say in the short term, almost no impact. I think in the, sh in the short term, training is going to matter way, way more. And in the short term, your health is not going to be what impacts muscle growth. It's a, it's a local phenomenon for the most part. Now, in the long term, I think staying healthy is quite important. And if you're not in a good place in terms of your cardio, in terms of systemic inflammation, in terms of your work capacity, in terms of your recovery capacity, in terms of how you sleep, etc. I mean, health matters to a natural bodybuilder. It has to, because if you're unhealthy, you just won't make gains. Whereas I think for an enhanced lifter... I mean, how many people have we seen with absolutely terrible blood work, but they're really fucking jacked? Like, they're super jacked, but they're near death. Like, that's just not going to happen if you're natural, because if you're that sick, you just, you won't be gaining muscle, right? Short term, it might work, but long term, health and gains are more tied together than a lot of people think. How much do you think stability affects hypertrophy? I get that the more stable the movement is, the better it is for muscle growth, and unstable movements such as including BOSU balls are not that good, but there are other viable movements that are very unstable, and yet people tend to recommend them all the time. I'm talking about rings. So I think the difference between a BOSU ball squat and rings is that for ring training, you can create your own stability, whereas with a BOSU ball squat, it's just not possible to create enough stability to lift even close to as heavy. So there needs to be a, a minimum threshold of stability that can allow your stabilizers to kick in so that it is enough overall stability. Um, and the rings are great. I really enjoy rings. Uh, I have a ring training book if you guys want to check that out. It is has a whole bunch of exercises and it is written for hypertrophy. It's not written for a gymnast or anything like that. It's written for people who want to use rings to get jacked and they can absolutely be very effective. And you need just that minimum threshold of stability, but beyond that, more stability probably doesn't really help. 
My next question, what was your experience like with dumbbell pullovers? Will you reintroduce them? So I use them occasionally. I do think that they're a movement that you want to use and progress with gradually, just because it is loading that full shoulder extension uh, in a way that a lot of movements don't. When you're doing a pull-up, you're not getting like that, that pushing back effect. I like them. I tend to do them completely on the bench rather than across the bench. You can try both and see which you prefer. I prefer the added stability of being on the bench. Some people prefer being across the bench and really being able to sort of lengthen out that way. Um, and I, I like them. They're not something I keep in the program all the time, um, but I do think that they have, they have quite a unique feel. But overall, I think I prefer it with the cable because I can get almost as much of a stretch and then I can also get the rest of the range of motion as well. The main issue with the dumbbell pullover is that it's it's really only difficult in a fairly small part of the range of motion, which is the stretched part of the range of motion, which is probably important. Um, but overall, I think that, at least for me, I prefer a cable. Next question, does frequency matter at all when weekly volume is equated? Yes. So some people might point to a meta-analysis where they said that, oh, actually, we were wrong. Frequency doesn't matter. It's just the volume that matters. But you have to understand that a meta-analysis is looking at many different studies. Some studies said that higher frequency was better. Some said that lower frequency is better. Um, and then in, in each study, there's going to be individuals. And some of those found that higher frequency was better. Some found that lower frequency is better. So you can't just look at a meta-analysis and be like, no differences. Well, there might be differences for you. And I found that once a week training for a muscle group just does not work well. And this is something that I've talked to a lot of people and they agree with me, but not everyone. Some people prefer lower frequency. They hit it hard. Then they give themselves this nice big window to fully recover and maybe even resensitize a little bit. That's why a lot of people get more sore on a bro split. It's not necessarily just more volume. It's just that you're spending a whole bunch of time between um, between workouts and you're sort of getting that resensitization effect. I don't like that and I need higher frequency, especially on movements that are even a little bit technical because uh, I just need more touches on the bar, man. On the other hand, Romanian deadlifts, I'm fine doing once every six days, once every seven days, maybe once every five days. But if I do three hard sets of RDLs and I come back four days later, I'm just not recovered, right? I just need more time for me personally on that movement. Whereas like a rear delt fly or something like that, or, or you know, triceps, they recover much more quickly. And so I find that uh, I just need more frequency on those movements. So this is a big part of programming and fitting all these Tetris pieces together of, okay, this movement needs a little bit longer. This movement I can do more frequently. This movement needs more volume or less volume etc. And then adding in maybe some high intensity techniques or or adding in different amounts of volume, maybe changing the volume over time. And so you know, anyone who says like training is super simple, well, you are either super gifted or you are not reaching your potential. And, you know, either way, that's not going to apply to most people who uh, are watching my videos. Could you summarize all your injuries due to lifting and how you overcame them? So I haven't had a ton of injuries. Some people see me train and they're like, man, you must snap your shit up all the time. Not really. Uh, the biggest one I had was the QL. And that was an annoying one because I couldn't sit for long periods of time. I couldn't stand for long periods of time. I could walk, but very carefully keeping everything braced. And uh, I didn't know what the fuck a QL was before I, uh, before I messed it up. But, um, and mostly I overcame that from finding stuff that didn't piss it off. I probably re-injured it seven, eight, nine times on seven, eight, nine different movements. And so finding out what movements pissed it off and what, what positions didn't agree with it, and then slowly rehabbing it and strengthening up the core and the muscles around it, uh, was really, really important. And it took time. It probably took eight or nine months until it was not even fully repaired, recovered, but until I felt like, okay, now I can train however I want to train.
Also, I had a I had biceps tendonitis back in 2022, and I think this was just too many incline curls, too soon, too heavy, too close to failure. Like I was doing uh, triples and sets of four beyond failure, and you know partials and shit like that. And it was just I was probably doing 20, 25 sets of that per week, uh, and it was just too much. Just sometimes it's it's not the movement it's sometimes not even how you do it it's just too much too soon and your body can't adapt so um i stopped doing that movement for a while and i kind of worked around it i avoided what hurt i modified a lot of my back training so that it was more sort of sweeping away from the biceps right like a standing cable pullover it's not working the biceps at all if anything it's the triceps and so i, I you know worked those in and then for rows i avoided like the end of the range of motion that kind of stretched that, that area out and kind of did like more partials, et cetera. Um, apart from that, I don't think I've had anything really like no, no shoulder issues, no back issues. Knees are generally pretty good. Uh, generally, if you're natural, I think you can see injuries sneak up on you. Um, you don't see that all that many acute injuries, maybe occasionally, uh, but generally, if you're intelligent and not stubborn, you can course correct before it becomes an issue most of the time. Next question, how would you try to improve cardio while lifting six days a week? So I currently lift six days a week, sometimes seven, sometimes five, rarely five, but but usually six. Occasionally, I won't take a day off and I'll just go into the next, the next week if I feel fine. I do uh, legs first day upper second day and then the bro day is on the day three and on the day three i do cardio usually like 10 to 15 minutes which doesn't sound like a lot and it's not a lot but it is it is tough it is hard i mean it's it's till mental failure it's till i give up basically and so you know get my heart rate up to 190 200 somewhere on there uh and then for me that's enough to keep any kind of work capacity that I need. I'll do a whole video on uh, on cardio pretty soon. I do think that it is important. I do think that a lot of people are lacking work capacity, and that can really, really uh, impact their results. And I don't think it's talked about quite enough. Now, if you have like a push pull leg split, do it on the push uh, before away from the leg. So push, do cardio, then pull legs, and then push, do it then pull legs. It is after a leg workout, so it might be tough. But so maybe you have that second session after the leg workout be maybe a 20 or 30 minute, not as intense. And then the first one you can have really intense because it's not near uh, any lower body stuff. Generally, cardio is going to be working around lower body, right? Because those are generally using the same muscles because if cardio is not working your lower body, it's probably not cardio. So it's the best form of cardio, which I guess is also lower body. Hmm. All right, next question. Should the upper back and traps be categorized separately from lats in regards to the 10 to 20 weekly sets protocol? Fair enough. It's a pretty big range. I'll, I'll let that slide, even if I don't think it's 100% accurate most of the time. Same with things like posterior chain, front, side, rear delts, etc. Uh, and he added in an edit here. I think everyone is missing the point. If you categorize each muscle group from the list below, and try to hit 15 weekly sets, you will be doing 240 total weekly sets. That's 40 sets per workout, six times per week. Actually, I was doing about that for a while. Now I've reduced it. I don't know anyone who was recovering from that. Well, it was it was, you know, <laughs> it was not easy. In fact, I often stagnated. Yeah, that, that is certainly too much for the vast, vast, vast majority of people. So again, which muscles do you group together and which do you count separately? And if you say compounds count as one set for each muscle group involved, to what degree? A chin-up is not going to be as effective as a biceps curl for the biceps. Mike Menzer fucking crying right now. There's a lot of gray area on a seemingly popular topic. And he listed the muscle groups. Chest, front delts, side delts, rear delts, upper back, traps, lats, biceps, triceps, neck, ab, forearms, glutes, hams, quads, calves. Nailed it. So I tend to group things by movement pattern which kind of turns all this on their on its head where you have push, press, pull, row, hinge, squat, and then you have your isolations. And so, you know, squats are generally going to be 
quads, glutes, adductors, which I don't know if you listed. There's another one. Uh, there are going to be some spinal erectors, some core. Uh, in general, I think it is very difficult to try to train this way. And I'm not sure if it's really worth trying to track in this fashion. I think Boost Camp actually does have a way to break this down to where, okay, a set of bench press is this much for chest and this much for triceps. And then it, it kind of shows you how much exact volume you're doing. I think this can work, but if you're trying to track it yourself, it's going to be a huge pain in the ass. So you should get Boost Camp. I also am very hesitant to suggest trying to target a certain amount of volume. When people are like, well, 10 to 20 sets, that means I need 10 sets or I'm just not growing. Probably not, you know? I think the vast majority of people can get results on, like you can't get results on eight, eight sets, like eight sets on quads per week, you can't get results. What about hamstrings? Uh, what, what about chest? I mean, you, you might have to increase beyond that as, at a certain point, but I think if you're training with good technique to failure, 10 sets is a lot. It is quite a lot. And I actually do less volume than I used to because my sets are harder, the technique is better, more focused, probably better activation, etc. And so, yeah, I would be very hesitant to try to attack these high volumes in most cases. I also think it's possible to get to the point of overthinking very, very quickly on this where you're like, well, my Helms row is a little bit sweepier than most people, and so it's a little bit more lats than traps. Uh, but but maybe my lats were a little bit tight last week, and so I was using a bit more traps. So perhaps this week it's it's 0.6 for traps. It's just like, come on. And uh, I don't track my volume anymore. There's something known as Goodhart's Law, where when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So in other words, your volume is just supposed to be something that you measure in order to have an idea of how much work you're doing. But when it becomes something that you are trying to do a certain amount of, especially when you're ignoring the other variables, I think it can actually become counterproductive. And that's what happened to me where I was like, uh, this study said volume is the main driver of growth. And therefore I would ignore everything else and just try to get as much volume as possible. And uh, I didn't grow because I was doing too much and I wasn't using those other variables, which are still very, very important for muscle growth. So you see these studies where it's like, wow, volume, super important. Proximity to failure, super important. So I'll just do all the volume to failure. Oh no, beyond failure might be important as well. So I'll do all the volume beyond failure, and then you just can't recover and, or you get hurt or something else. So you have to understand that volume is important, but it's certainly not the only thing. All right, that is all for this video. I hope you liked it, enjoyed it, and found it informative and educational and all that good stuff. And if you want to dive deeper into the depths of exercise, hypertrophy, informational stuff, you can check out my books. They will help you a lot in your fitness journey. They are priced extremely reasonably and they have been extremely well received. And so you can pick those up if you want to either support the channel or support your own gains or possibly do both. I really appreciate it. And your guns will appreciate it as well. Uh, so thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.